All right. And so our last and um, speaker before the break is um, Anastasia Minavina from, I hope I uh, pronounced that correctly, from um, St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis. And can we have our slides up? I think I could just start introducing myself uh, and you pronounce it correctly. Yes, indeed. My name is Anastasia Minervina. I'm a postdoc in Paul Thomas's lab at St. Jude uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And I would like, I would really like to talk about the epitop specific uh, T cells uh, to SARS CoV 2. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. Again, nice to meet you <laughs> all. And thanks to the organizers for letting me give this talk today. So I think this audience doesn't need a lot of introduction to either SARS-CoV-2 or T-cells, so I will just do it very briefly. As you all know, T-cells, they play an important role in antiviral immune response, and this is also true for the response against SARS-CoV-2. And I specifically uh, will talk about CD8 T-cells that are responsible for, for the clearance of virally infected cells. And to be able to um, kill the virally infected cells, the T cell should first recognize this antigen presented on the surface of the cell. And the antigen is presented with a complex of MHT molecule, or if we talk about humans, it is also called HLA. And it does it with its T cell receptor. And to be able to recognize the vast diversity of antigens that are uh, around us, the T cell receptor itself should be very diverse. And that's why it is formed in the semi-random process of PDJ recombination. And in principle, the diverse sequence that uh, results from the VDJ recombination process contains all the information about the T cell specificity. And one of the ways of studying the T uh, epitope specific T cells is staining with MHC multimers. And for this study, we use the rather new technology, which is now available commercially from Imodex. The idea is that you could pre-select the epitopes of your choice. You could load them on MHC monomers, and then you could multimerize these monomers with the dextran backbones. And these dextran backbones, they're very nice because they have both the fluorescent dye, which allows you to get the cells um, out of the sample uh, using the regular flow cytometry, but they also have the DNA barcode, which you could, uh, allows you to pull all the dextramers together sequence them on 10x genomics platform, and then use this barcode to assess the T cell specificity. And as I said, the good thing about the MHT multimer is that it allows you to get the cells ex vivo and access the phenotypes of the cells ex vivo. But the problem is that you really need to pre-select epitopes and you want to select good epitopes. So for this, we just use the published literature uh, and a lot of it actually came from uh, the lab of Shane Crotty and Alessandro Seta here. Also, there was a nice data set published by Adaptive Biotechnologies that helped us to narrow down the list of the epitopes we wanted to look at. And uh, we ended up selecting 18 epitopes from SARS-CoV-2 that were restricted to five HLA alleles. And importantly, we selected them in a way that within each HLA, we have both spike and non-spike specific epitopes. Some of those epitopes also had a very close analogs in the common cold coronaviruses, and we also added them to the panel. And uh, we used this uh, panel of MHC testers to assess the epitope-specific T cells after the different exposures to SARS-CoV-2. So we had donors that were only vaccinated, that was all Pfizer vaccine. We also had individuals who were infected only, infected and vaccinated. And we also had a small but nice cohort of breakthrough infections. So the people who were first vaccinated and then infected. And a small note here, this was all pre-Omicron. So it was the breakthrough infection with either Delta or some other variant. And uh, another important point is that is what you could see here on the sampling timeline is that for the infected individuals, we actually had a second time point taken which was after the two doses of Pfizer vaccine. And uh, with this cohort and the uh, MHC multimer technology, we wanted to ask uh, two important questions. The first one is, does the repeated exposure to the same SARS-CoV-2 antigen boost the pre-existing T-cell memory? And the second one is rather opposite. So does an exposure to the novel antigen induce the new memory and diversify the T-cell repertoire? 
And we were able to get the epitope specific T cells from almost all donors in our cohort. And this is just the results of flow cytometry. So it's just a fraction of all epitope specific CDA T cells across all cohorts. And you could see that there is no significant differences suggesting that the overall magnitude of the T cell response among those people was pretty comparable. So what you would like to do next to take all your sequencing data and actually get for each of your cell, what donor it came from, what uh, epitope it is specific for. And this is a not a very exciting process. So there's data deconvolution. So I will not go into any details here, but if you want to discuss it, uh, I'm, I'm ready to do it afterwards. And uh, you end up with this for each dextromer, you define what you consider the dextromer positive and dextromer negative population. And basically this corresponds to the uh, flow plot, but instead or the MFI you have the UMI count for each of the dextromers. And we wanted to have a way to test this deconvolution procedure. And uh, in our data set, we had clonally expanded cells. Uh, and uh, all the cells will have the exactly same TCR, meaning that they should be uh, specific to the exactly same epitope. So what you could see here is each line is uh, one of the expanding clonotypes in our data. All these T cell clones are more than 20 cells. And the color represents how the um, cells were assigned to the epitope. So if the color is consistent for the whole bar, it means that all cells independently were assigned to the exactly same epitope. And you can see that in, generally it's uh, pretty good as part from this small group down here. And this uh, cells are actually assigned to the two epitopes that are very similar. One is from common cold coronavirus and the other one comes from the SARS-CoV-2. So we thought mm, maybe the cells are cross-reactive between these two epitopes. And uh, we saw here that indeed each cell could actually bind both of this uh, dextromers. This is just the correlation of the UMI counts for both versions of the dextromers. Uh, which is what we expect. And we decided that we need to test it uh, experimentally. So what we did, we cloned one of those presumably cross-reactive TCRs into the jerked cells that had an endogenous NFAT GFP reporter. We co-cultured them uh, in the presence of artificial APCs with HLA-B15, which is the restriction for the epitope, and pulsed with them with either common cold or uh, version of this peptide or SARS-CoV-2 version. And this, the results are here. So the first column is the unstimulated control. And you could see that uh, this uh, T-cell line nicely responds to both these epitopes. And you could do the same thing with the dextromer staining when you just put these two epitopes on different dyes, and you could see that all this population is double positive. So we were able to formally prove that these T cells are indeed cross-reactive to both these versions of CD8. And um, at this point, we were very sure that our deconvolution procedure works nicely. So we could proceed with dividing the total response to all the epitope-specific responses. And not surprisingly, we see that even within our pre-selected set of the epitopes, some of them are more immunodominant than the others. Um, especially, uh, I think people who do a lot of uh, COVID epitopes, they know this one, which is A1TTD. And we had a single donor who had almost 10% of his response dedicated towards this one epitope. And importantly, this uh, immunodominant epitopes, they were uh, from both spike and non-spike epitopes of SARS-CoV-2. So, uh, we wanted to look whether different types of numbers of antigen exposures actually uh, influence how does epitope specificities are distributed um, within the memory pool. And for the most robust comparison, we looked uh, within a single edge lay. So on the plot on the left, you could see that each bar is a sample and the color indicates the fraction or the response from the sample dedicated towards uh, one of the epitopes within the AO1. We had uh, six different epitopes for this HLA. And you could appreciate that the fraction of the pink epitope, which is the only uh, spike specific epitope, actually goes, oh, that's not me, uh, goes um, very high after the vaccination of previously infected individuals. And the same thing is shown to the right. So for one donor, you see that 
right after the infection, most of his response is dedicated towards non-spike epitopes. But then after the vaccination, you see that there is an increase in proportion of, of spike. And this is just the quantification of uh, within all HLA alleles. So indeed, we see uh, a significant increase in the proportion of spike specific cells after the vaccination or the previously infected individuals. This suggests to us that mRNA vaccination indeed could boost the pre-existing spike-specific T cells. And what was also interesting to us is that if you look at the breakthrough infections, either here or here, you could appreciate that they actually have a very large non-spike-specific response, which suggests that instead of just recalling the spike-specific memory that they had after the vaccination, they have a now a new robust non-spike-specific memory that was formed after the infection. The next step uh, we did was to look at the uh, phenotypes of the cepitop specific T cells. And uh, on the uh, left, you could see the UMAP uh, based on the gene expression. And uh, not surprisingly, again, we saw all kinds of CDA T cells spanning all the way from um, central memory over here to a more effector memory, effector memory array, and even some cells that have exhaustion markers. But if you will break down this UMAP uh, to the UMAPs by different exposures, there is not a lot of difference over there. So we don't see any uh, specific shifts in phenotypes uh, within these different exposure types, which suggests that independent of the type of or numbers of the exposure you have, you at least in the typical, your phenotypical memory pool is pretty consistent. So, and Oh, okay. And as I showed you before, there is an increase in, uh, there is a recall of spice specific uh, memory after the uh, vaccination of previously infected individuals. And we wanted to see whether we could find any phenotypic signs of this recall in our data set. And this is what you could see on this diagram. So for non spike specific cells, uh, almost all clusters stay consistent, but for the spike specific cells, we see a significant increase in this blue cluster. And this cluster is, uh, uh, the uh, gene expression of this cluster is consistent with what is called effective memory array cells or terminal differentiated memory cells. So this suggests that T cell memory recall actually shifts the phenotypes of uh, spike specific cells towards a more differentiated memory. And uh, now we move uh, to the T cell repertoires of all the cells. So this is a long-standing goal of the Paul Thomas lab to investigate the, the TCR sequences of epitope-specific T cells. And one of the way of looking at uh, the epitope-specific uh, T cells uh, and TCR repertoires is the similarity networks where each dot is an alpha beta clonotype and they are connected with an edge if they are very similar. Here we use the TCR dist metric to define the similarity. And uh, on the, uh, the similarity network, they are colored by the assigned epitope. And as expected, you could see that the clusters are, for different epitopes are virtually independent, which also suggests that our deconvolution procedure was done nicely. And uh, what we wanted to ask biologically, whether this TCL motors that form these clusters are actually shared among all these epitope uh, antigen exposure types. And I think it's mostly uh, evident for this uh, pink cluster over, it's so just, it's very hot for me, sorry, here. Uh, so uh, you could see that it was actually shared across all antigen exposure types that we looked at. And for those of you who do a lot of uh, SARS-CoV-2 T cells, this is a very famous EO2 wild Q epitope. Um, and uh, we actually moved even further to prove that the specificity of the cells was indeed uh, what we predicted. So we selected the most central clusters from all these uh, big motifs. For some of them, we even selected two and we cloned them into the Jukat cell lines and then stimulated them with the cognate peptide in the presence of restricted uh, HLA uh, expressing cells. So the first column all the time is the unstimulated control. And then you see that there is a nice response from NFAT GFP reporter for all these types. So Actually, all the T cell lines that we cloned were proved to be specific um, to what we thought it will be specific, which is a good thing. And we then decided that we could uh, use this T cell lines to do something more scientific. And uh, we 
decided to test them across uh, different SARS-CoV-2 variants that we found in the GSA database. Of note, none of the studied epitopes had any mutations in Omicron, but I would like to show you a few examples where we found that results are very interesting. So the first one is this A1TTD epitope. And you could see that not all the mutations actually result in immune escape. This is one good thing to know. The second interesting thing, I think is highlights why the TCR diversity is important. So for this, two different uh, uh, T cells from uh, TCRs from uh, different parts of the cluster, one of them could still recognize this mutation, but the other one fails to recognize it. And then uh, we actually saw one example of an escape from uh, T cell recognition. This is for A24 epitope, which um, is present in more than 95% of Delta variant. And indeed, the major public cluster of the TCRs could not recognize this mutation anymore. And some people even speculated that uh, this mutation played a great role in the, I don't know, second or the third wave in Europe. But I think it needs more data to be shown that it's indeed true. And uh, uh, here is the small summary about all this. So we, we were able to show that mRNA vaccine could elicit a uh, really good T-cell response in terms of the magnitude, TCR diversity, and phenotype. We also show that mRNA vaccination could recall and boost the pre-existing spike-specific T-cells. Uh, we also showed that breakthrough infections uh, now diversify their response to what's non-spike, which is a very good news for all people who have the breakthrough infections. We identified a new CD8 epitopes that is cross-reactive to common cold coronaviruses. And this is also all published. And all this more than 4,000 SARS-CoV-2 TCRs are available. And they think they should be available in the novel release of PDJTB as well. And I want to spend, I, I, do I have like a few minutes left? Okay, then I will spend my minutes left to show you uh, why we think that getting such data sets of epitope specific TCRs is important. And for this, I will uh, get a step back to uh, our study we published last year, but the whole study was actually done in very early in 2020. So in early March 2020, we got access to longitudinal blood sampling from two individuals who had mild COVID-19, and we were able to collect uh, PBMCs and CD4 and CD8 cells from all those time points after mild uh, SARS, uh, COVID-19. And we, uh, what we did, we reconstructed both TCR alpha and TCR beta repertoires from all those time points. Which is also nice about the donors is that they actually had the pre-infection time points available from 2018 and 2019. And our initial expectation was that at least mild cases of COVID-19 shouldn't be any different from any other viral infection. And thus, the T cell response should go through phases of rapid expansion and contraction. And you could use the TCR repertoire to actually identify this expanding or contracting cells by just comparing the frequencies of the TCRs on different time points. And we wanted to first uh, do it in an unsupervised way. And for all the identification of responding clonotypes, I'm not using any pre-infection time points. So the first thing we did, we uh, made an unsupervised clustering on the clonal trajectory. And the clonal trajectory is just the frequency of each clone on different days after the infection. And these are the results of this clustering for two donors. So they see that both donors have these three very nice clusters. The purple cluster, oh, and here is an average trajectory of the cells from different clusters. So you could see that the purple cluster has very stable um, frequencies across all time points. These are just abundant clones from your repertoire. They have nothing to do with SARS-CoV-2. The green cluster is exactly what we expected. So it peaks on day 15 after the infection, then they contract and we don't see them. Oh, we see some of them uh, on day 85, but still they contract rapidly. The yellow cluster is actually more mysterious. We still don't have any evidence that it's related to SARS-CoV-2. So I will not talk about this one today. So we will focus on the SARS-CoV-2 responding clones, which are clones contracting from day 15 to day 85. And uh, uh, we were able to identify hundreds of the responding clonotypes in both donors. And this is what happens if you will just 
uh, plot the overall frequency on different time points. So you see that there is a nice peak on day 15. And as expected, they were almost present on uh, pre-pandemic samples. And uh, we saw the strong response in both CD4 and CD8 T cells. So as you could see here, this longitudinal approach is a good way of getting you the overall response to SARS-CoV-2. So now we have the all response to SARS-CoV-2 and we could use the data generated afterwards, so the CD8 specific T cells to actually try to map the targets of the total response to SARS-CoV-2. And this is what you get, I think, in the good case scenario. So you are able to map about 30% uh, of your response. An interesting uh, point here is also that the most immunodominant thing is this cross-reactive T cell epitope I told you about before. So whether it's actually protective in these cases, we still don't know, but I think it's very interesting. And I think our ultimate goal is to be able to collect more data and uh, to be able to decode all T cell response to the epitopes by just looking on the bulk T cell repertoire. And I think for the, at least for SARS-CoV-2, maybe we are not that far from reaching this goal. And with this, I wanna end up and thank all the people involved. Uh, so the CD8 epitopes specific study was done in Paul Thomas lab. I uh, want to acknowledge Mikhail Pogarelli, who is the co my core first author on this paper. I also would like to thank the St. Jude Trace study team who was responsible for getting this cohort ongoing. And uh, the longitudinal part was done in uh, Chudakov lab with a great help of collaborators from Kiel and also in ENS, the group of Alexandra Valchak and Thierry Mara. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to take questions. Thanks, Anastasia, for this great talk, which is now open for discussion. That's really nice work. Thanks for thanks for sharing all that. Uh, uh, just a, a, a technical question about essentially the definition of clonotype or how you guys define clonotype. So is it in your hands, is it a strictly TCR beta sequence clonotype or is it beta plus alpha and is it it's not a perfect match you're requiring right but is it or is it a perfect match and if it's not a perfect match do you weigh tcr alpha and beta differently and i think I, I thought on that last slide you were defining clonotype based on tcr beta so that was why yeah. i was asking how do you uh, obviously you guys think about this a lot so what's what, what's the what's the logic to it yeah, so uh, when we did the single cell sequencing, we defined each clonotype as a unique nucleotide sequence of both alpha and beta. And of course, we do a lot of work trying to get rid of any duplicates that are not real uh, clonotypes, because with alpha beta pairing, sometimes in 10x, you have all these weird artifacts. If we do bulk TCR sequencing, again, it's a unique nucleotide sequence. Uh, which in this case would be, of course, unpaired alpha and beta. And when we do matching between two data sets, of course, we have to select one which is fewer. And uh, then, so you only match, you, usually for the matching, so I will come back. So the matching, you use amino acid sequences usually. So because it's from two different data sets, so you don't expect people to have the exactly same nucleotide sequence, of course. So you could use either amino acid sequence of CD, TCL beta here. Uh, you could do the same for alpha, but it will be independent. And uh, yeah, and you could also do it with like fuzzy matching, but only in this case, but you don't call it a clonotype, then you call it a cluster. <laughs> I hope I, yeah. Covered. So thank you for the great talk. Um, with the TCR disk clusters, I think you mentioned that one of them was like public and there were multiple individuals. Um, oh. And I was wondering how, if there were multiple TCR clusters with multiple individuals. Uh, yeah, maybe I didn't make it clear. So all these clusters are public. They were are found in multiple individuals. This is what is shown. It's not a heat map like this plot here. So basically uh, each uh, box here uh, that is colored shows the presence in the individual. So you could see that, for example, first cluster was present among, I don't know, 15 different donors. 
So all of them are very public. Yes. Oh, I see. Cool. Thank you. All right. I don't see any further questions. So thanks again, Anastasia. Thank you.